Hello, I'm Dr. Colleen Shogan, Archivist of the United States. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the National Archives Genealogy Series, our biggest genealogy event of the year. Over the next several weeks, our experts will show you how to use National Archive records to research your family history. This year's sessions will help you unlock a wide range of records, from standard passport applications to captured German records relating to American POWs. I've really enjoyed learning more about my family from our records, and I hope you will too. Before we get started, I want to thank our amazing staff at the National Archives who put these programs together. They are excited to help you learn more about your personal history through the collections at the National Archives. Thank you for joining the 2024 National Archives Genealogy Series, and I hope you enjoy this year's program. Welcome to the National Archives and Records Administration's 2024 Genealogy Series. My name is Erin Townsend, and I am the coordinator for this year's program. We are so happy you've joined us. Every year, the National Archives hosts the Genealogy Series, a free educational genealogy event broadcast on YouTube. Our presenters are records experts from National Archives locations across the United States. The sessions offer family history research tools on federal records and are open to everyone, from beginners to experienced family historians. All are welcome. We invite you to join the conversation. During each session's premiere, you can participate with the presenters and other family historians via live chat. Ask questions and get the presenter's answers anytime throughout the video and for an additional 10 minutes after the presentation ends. Here's how to engage in the live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch chat because the speaker will answer your questions there. Type your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Please keep your questions on today's topic. We are offering five genealogy sessions on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time, starting May 21st and ending June 25th. We will not have a session on June 11th. If you miss a premiere broadcast, please know that videos and handouts remain available online after the event, where you can view them at your convenience. Welcome to our first session in the series entitled Passport Records, Passport Applications at NARA, 1790s to 1925. Our presenter is Claire Kluskins. Claire is an archivist at the National Archives in Washington, DC, and a subject matter expert for genealogy and census-related records. She has worked at the National Archives and Records Administration since 1992. Claire, thank you for helping us kick off this year's genealogy series. I'm turning it over to you. Good day to you, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about passport applications and related records in the National Archives of the United States. Family history researchers have long recognized the potential value of these records to their research. In addition, more than 30 years ago, the National Archives microfilmed many of these records to make them more readily accessible. Today, digital images of those microfilmed records and other records can be found online on popular genealogy websites or in the National Archives catalog. Today, we'll focus on passport applications from the 1790s to 1925. Passport records from April 1925 to the present remain in the custody of the Department of State. There is information on its website how to file a Freedom of Information Act request to obtain copies of historical records in its custody. Passport records and other State Department records are in Record Group 59, General Records of the Department of State, at the National Archives at College Park, Maryland. My colleagues at that facility can answer your questions about these records. The National Archives website at archives.gov has a lot of information about the federal records in our custody, and there is a passport applications webpage with information about these records. 
If you want to delve into the history of United States passports, there are two excellent books that are freely available online. The United States Passport, Past, Present, and Future was published in 1976 by the Department of State, and The Passport in America, The History of a Document, was published in 2012. As I mentioned earlier, digital images of many passport records can be found online. There are two types of records you will find. There are indexes to the applications that show names of applicants, the date of the application, and the application number. There are passport applications in multiple record series that cover different time periods and are for different kinds of applicants. The handout that accompanies this presentation indicates the different online locations as of the spring of the year 2024. Why should family history researchers search for U.S. passport applications? There were a lot of U.S. citizens traveling overseas for different reasons. There were businessmen traveling on business, tourists, and naturalized U.S. citizens going back home to their original country to visit their relatives. The number of passports issued grew as the nation grew and as travel became faster and easier, as technology transitioned from sailing vessels relying on wind power to steamships running on coal and later oil. For the 63 year period from 1810 to 1873, the number of passports issued was just over 130,000. Then for the 32 year period from 1877 to 1909, the number issued was almost three times as great at over 369,000. Then in the 13 year period from 1912 to 1925, there were over 1.1 million issued. For comparison purposes, we see that foreign travel has increased even more in today's jet airplane age with 24 million passports issued in federal fiscal year 2023. Who applied for passports? Not surprisingly, in the 19th century, about 95% of the applicants were men. The man's passport included his wife and children if they were traveling with him. In those situations, the wife's name may be omitted. She's Mrs. Smith, or whatever the husband's surname was, but the children's names and ages are usually included. By 1923, the number of women applying for a passport in their own name had significantly increased to about 40%. It's important to understand that a person might have applied for a passport several times over their lifetime. As you can see from the chart on the screen, from the 1790s to 1959, the passport was valid for two years or less. Therefore, a person who traveled abroad frequently, or at least more than once, will have more than one record. Now that you've gotten excited about passport applications, you'll need to adjust your expectations a little bit. The general rule was that until June 21, 1941, U.S. citizens were not required to have a passport for foreign travel. There were some exceptions, of course. For a brief time, seven months, during the Civil War, passports were required. They were recommended by President Wilson in December 1915, but still not required. They were required from May 1918 to 1921 due to World War I. And of course, until fairly recently, Travel to Canada and some other Western Hemisphere locations did not require a passport. So there could be numerous instances of Americans traveling abroad without a passport before 1941. Another thing to remember is that resident aliens were not eligible for a U.S. passport, except there were two time spans when an alien who had declared their intent to become a naturalized citizen could obtain a U.S. passport. Remember that becoming a U.S. citizen was usually a two-step process done at a federal, state, or county court of record. The first step was declaring one's intent to become a citizen, and the second step, taken later, was to petition for naturalization. So for aliens who had taken the first step towards citizenship, the Declaration of Intent, were allowed to apply for a U.S. passport from March 1863 to May 1866 during the American Civil War period, and again from March 1907 to June 1920. There have been four types of U.S. passports, regular, 
emergency, special, and insular, and we'll take a closer look at each of these on the next several slides. We'll start with regular passport applications. Applications for 1795 to March 1925 are in National Archives custody. The earliest applications were handwritten letters, as we will see. Most were for people who were currently in the United States, but some were actually for Americans who were already overseas who made their request to the nearest U.S. consular or diplomatic official. By the 1860s, most were submitted on printed forms. And finally, it's interesting that there was no charge until July 1862 when a $3 fee began. What information will you find on a regular passport application? Usually, there will be the person's exact date of birth as well as their place of birth. Their physical description will include age, height, and color of eyes, hair, and complexion. Their occupation. It may include their expected foreign destination and reason for travel. If the person was a naturalized U.S. citizen, it should include the court and date of naturalization, and possibly even the name of the ship and date of her arrival in the United States. Since December 1914, there will be a photograph. Some of the earliest applications, as we've mentioned before, were handwritten letters, and some were made overseas, such as this one, from 1796, which says, in part, David Bacon, Nicholas Walm, Alex Wilson, citizens of Philadelphia, and members of the religious society of people called Quakers, who have been in Europe, being about to return in the ship William Penn, of which James Josiah was master, expected to sail immediately, but being informed it would be necessary to have passports from the American minister, called at his house this morning. They will take it kind if he would direct what is necessary to be done. A friend of theirs will call on him tomorrow about one o'clock for his instructions. So a lot of information about uh, these men and their situation in Europe at that time. In this application from 1835, James Cooper Jr. of Newcastle, Delaware, wrote a lengthy letter to James Eakin asking him to obtain passports for Samuel M. Cooper, age 30, and John E. Cooper, age 25, who went to St. Croix without first asking the State Department for a passport. He describes the weather and their seasickness and other particulars of their travel, so it is a little window into the journey of the two young men. Some notaries public created their own passport application form to save themselves time. On this one from 1835, notary public John Gill of Maryland stated that William Herman, American citizen, aged 28, five feet, eight inches tall, with a rather high forehead, black eyes, a common nose, large mouth, prominent chin, black hair, dark complexion, and a long face, was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and that John Herman, his father, came also to swear that William had been born in Baltimore. So there we get both father and son. This is an example of a family application being more than one page. Therefore, you as the researcher need to make sure that you look for all the related pages and not just stop with the first image that you see. The first two images are shown on this page, which are his application and his oath of allegiance to the United States. It indicates Abraham P. Grant, born in New York State on April 5, 1804, applied on March 8, 1869 in the District of Columbia for himself and his daughters, Mary B., Josephine L., and Elizabeth P., who are also native-born citizens of the United States. You see MCH8 in the top corner of the left image. That's an abbreviation for March 8. These are the next three images, and they are part of the Grant family's application. You see MCH8 at the top of these also for March 8. These are the personal descriptions of Mary B. Grant, Josephine L. Grant, and Elizabeth P. Grant, including their ages. These pages by themselves don't make any sense. They make sense, they have context, when you realize they are pages that are associated with Abraham P. Grant's application. So please, when you are looking at images online, not just passports, but any record online, 
don't just look at the record for your person, look at the pages before and after to make sure you understand the full context of what you are seeing. This is the passport application of Matthias Mazenach from 1876. He was born at Rybakovic, Bohemia on March 14, 1853. This is a good example of how the date and port of naturalization were written sideways on the form. In this case, he was naturalized at the Superior Court of Cook County, Illinois on October 31, 1874. It is also noted very interestingly that his name and his naturalization record was given as Mariner. For someone interested in this man, the passport record provides an excellent pointer to a record in which his name was not spelled as expected for whatever unknown reason. So it is very useful in this regard. By 1892, we have pre-printed standard forms. Here is Anton Wilhelm, born at Copenhagen, Denmark on November 8, 1857. He immigrated to the United States on the vessel Iceland that departed from Copenhagen, arriving about December 1, 1885. He resided at Chicago from 1885 to 1891 and naturalized at the Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois on April 6, 1891. He was a dry goods dealer. He planned to go abroad temporarily and return to the U.S. in about one year. So there's a lot of information on that one page. And of course, it also includes his personal description and certification by his friend, Ferdinand Gerke, that he is who he says he is. Here also from 1892 is a passport application by Milton R. Wood, who was born at Martinsburg, Lewis County, New York on October 8. 4, 1840. Many places in the United States, including the state of New York, did not require birth records until the early 1900s. So this passport record, and many others, essentially provides a birth record according to the person's understanding of when and where he was born. This is the last regular passport application that I will show. William Victor Prechtel of Norwalk, Ohio, applied for a passport in August 1917. This is during World War I. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio on August 3, 1897, the son of Charles Prechtel, who had been born in Cleveland. It says that William planned to visit England and France and to enter the American field and ambulance service. He planned to sail from New York on a ship owned by the French line on September 1, 1917. On the second page, shown at right, is his personal description and photograph and certification by his friend Leon Hiltz that he is who he says he is. The applicant also asks that his passport be sent to Mr. Beverly Miles, 14 Wall Street, New York City. Why was that? We digitally turn the page and the next image is a letter from his congressman confirming that William was going to Europe to be a volunteer ambulance driver and asking that the passport be issued and sent to Mr. Miles, who was an American Field Service representative in New York City. And the final image is a letter from the American Field Service confirming these facts. So all these records together give a snapshot into this young man's life at this time. Turning now to emergency passport applications, these were issued by U.S. diplomatic and consular officials abroad for emergency purposes and were valid for six months. They were issued for about 50 years, beginning in 1874, and are similar in content to regular passport applications. So what is an emergency? I'm sure it varied widely, but I will give you one interesting example of an emergency. Mrs. Cornelia A. Newt applied for an emergency passport on July 29, 1920. On this slide, we see at the right the two pages of her application. The image at the left is an enlargement of a section of the first page. Mrs. Cornelia A. Newt was born at Vermalsen, Netherlands on November 11, 1879. Her husband, John Newt, had immigrated to the U.S. from Rotterdam, Netherlands about August 1906 and had resided 14 and a half years in the U.S. from 1906 to 1920 at Sheridan, Wyoming. He became a naturalized citizen of the United States before the District Court of Sheridan County at Sheridan County, Wyoming on December 9, 1913. He was now residing at Vermalsen, Netherlands for the purpose of visiting parents and marriage. Sounds great. So what's Cornelius' emergency? 
let's turn to page two, which has Cornelia's lovely photo that I have enlarged for you. There is also a list of identifying documents submitted to the consular officer for his inspection. They include the marriage certificate of John Newt and Cornelia Alida Van Offeren, issued July 22, 1920, at Bermalson, the naturalization certificate of John Newt, the departmental passport of John Newt, number 182501, issued March 10, 1920. The reference to the departmental passport of John Newt is a reference to a regular passport issued the normal way by the State Department. So what was Cora's emergency? Well, before the passage of the Cable Act in September 1922, an alien woman who married an American citizen automatically became an American citizen upon marriage. Cornelia married John Newt in 1920, before the passage of that law. Upon saying, I do, Cornelia immediately became an American citizen. She had never left the Netherlands, had never been to the United States, had never seen Wyoming. But upon saying I do in a wedding ceremony in the Netherlands, she automatically became an American citizen. So her marriage was her emergency. Before she got on a boat to go to America with her new husband, she wanted a passport so that she could prove to the U.S. immigration authorities at her port of arrival that she was a U.S. citizen. In case you were wondering what John Newt looked like, here is his regular passport application for that departmental passport mentioned in Cora's emergency passport application. Cora's emergency passport was valid for only a short time. So in 1924, Cora applied for her own regular passport for herself and daughter Nellie. This application includes an affidavit to correct the omission of her marriage date on her original application. This is an example of a person having more than one passport application as well as an example of a person having two different types of applications due to their circumstances. Turning now to special passports, these were issued to U.S. Foreign Service personnel, military attaches, and other government officials traveling on official business, as well as dependent family members of those mentioned. As an example of an application for a special passport, here is Walter Huff, head curator of anthropology at the Smithsonian Institution, who is going to Brazil as a representative of the Smithsonian to speak at the International Congress of Americanists in 1922. We learned that he was born at Morgantown, West Virginia on April 23, 1859, and that his father, like Herges Huff, was born at Leesburg, Virginia. In addition to the application, the acting secretary of the Smithsonian wrote a letter confirming that Dr. Huff and the other staff member were going to a meeting in Brazil as representatives of the Smithsonian. And the chief clerk of the Smithsonian certified his employment and his date and place of birth as given in Smithsonian records. Turning now to insular possessions passport applications, Insular possessions are geographic areas not part of the United States over which the U.S. exercises sovereign control. NARA has applications filed from 1901 to 1911 by persons from those possessions who are already in the United States. And there are also applications filed at passport offices in Hawaii, Philippines, and Puerto Rico from 1907 to 1925. The information content is similar to the applications that we have already seen. Here is an insular passport application filed in the United States by Louis F. Melanta in January 1908. He was born in Puerto Rico in 1881, but was living in Buffalo, New York in 1908. We learn that his father, who was apparently deceased, had been a citizen of France. It also, of course, includes his physical description as other passport applications do. The application also includes supporting affidavits by two of his friends, Julius Di Castro and Domingo Marati. Here is an insular passport application filed in the Philippines by Rafael Viola, who was born March 27, 1893, at San Miguel, Philippines. His father, Maximo Viola, was also born at San Miguel, Philippines. There are also unusual passport records. These two images are from passports surrendered to U.S. Customs officials in 1917. 
of men returning from a construction project in France. This is a small series of records of about 273 images. We see on the left the passport of Thomas McAllowan, while on the right is the War Department Certificate of Identity of Harry E. McClure. He was a civilian employee of the War Department, and this certificate essentially served the same purpose as a passport. There are other passport records in the National Archives and Records Administration, including passport correspondence, applications for extension or amendment for 1918 to 1925, passport applications for travel to China from 1915 to 1925, applications for certificates of identity for U.S. citizens living in Germany, 1920 to 1921, and passport applications of wives of members of American expeditionary forces in Europe, 1919 to 1920. The links in the handout will give you more information about these records. Passport records April 1925 and later are still in the custody of the Department of State, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. However, the National Archives can help you a little bit. You can request from the National Archives a search of the State Department name index to the central decimal file, which covers the period 1910 to January 1963. Provide to the reference staff at archives2reference at nara.gov the following five items of information. Item one, a statement like, please search the State Department name index to the central decimal file, RG59, that's record group, 59. Four, item two, the name of the person that you're interested in. Item three, the approximate year and place of birth of that person. Item four, approximate years when a passport might have been issued. And item five, your contact information. Why specify State Department name index to the central decimal file? Well, the National Archives has billions of records, and we won't know which one you're interested in unless you tell us. For the sake of efficiency and avoiding frustration, be specific. Why should you specify a date span when a passport might have been issued? The index is in segments, and they are index cards, and they span 1910 to 1929, 1930 to 1939, 1940 to 1949, 1950 to 1959, and 1960 to January of 1963. The reference staff will want to know which segments to search. The reference staff will tell you if they find an index card, what it says, and if the related records are at the National Archives or the State Department. If the record is at the State Department, you will then file a Freedom of Information Act request with the State Department. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the National Archives has many historical records of the United States Department of State that are beyond the scope of this presentation, and our website has a lot of information about them. Also beyond the scope of this presentation are records of U.S. embassies, legations, consulates, and missions. And there's a lot of information on our website about all of these records. So thank you for your attention today, and I hope this presentation has been useful. Thank you again for watching. This ends the lecture portion of the broadcast, but we will continue to take your questions about today's topic in the chat. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email at inquire at nara.gov. Note that the videos and handouts will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. We plan future programs based on your feedback. Would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation form? At this time, I'd like to thank the Genealogy Series team who contributed to the success of this program. We are grateful for your work. If you enjoyed this video, check out our Know Your Records program. We have over 100 educational videos on how to conduct research at the National Archives. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in the chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions.
Thank you for joining us for today's presentation.